two men in a smoking room were talking of their private school days. At our school, said A, we had a ghost's footmark on the staircase. What was it like? Oh, very unconvincing, just the shape of a shoe with a square toe, if I remember right. The staircase uh, was a stone one. I, I never heard any story about the thing. But that seems odd when you come to think of it. Why didn't someone invent one, I wonder? You can never tell with little boys. They have a mythology of their own. There's a subject for you, by the way, the folklore of private schools. Yes. The crop is rather scanty, though. I imagine if you were to investigate the cycle of ghost stories, for instance, which the boys at private schools tell each other, they would all turn out to be highly compressed versions of stories out of books. Nowadays, the Strand and Pearsons and so on would be extensively drawn upon. Yeah, no doubt, said A. Publications like that weren't born or thought of in my time. Now, let's see. Now, I wonder if I can remember the staple ones that I was told. First, there was a house with a room in which a series of people insisted on passing a night, and each of them in the morning was found kneeling in a corner and just had time to say, I've seen it, and died. <laughs> I've got one. Um, there was a man who heard a noise in the passage at night, opened his door, and saw someone crawling towards him on all fours with his eye hanging out on his cheek. Yeah, th there was besides. Uh, yes, let me think. Uh, yes, the, the room where a man was found dead in a bed with a horseshoe mark on his forehead, and the floor under the bed was covered with marks of horseshoes also. I, I don't know why. There also, there was a lady who, on knocking her bedroom door in a strange house, heard a thin voice among the bed curtains saying, Now we are shut in for the night. <laughs> well, none of those had any explanation or sequel. Yes, I wonder if they still go on, those stories. Oh, likely enough, with additions from the magazines, as I say. You, you never heard, did you, of a real ghost at a private school? No, I thought not. Nobody has that I ever came across. From the way in which you said that, I gather that you have. Actually, I, I do. It happened at my private school thirty-odd years ago, and I haven't any explanation of it, although I've told it many times. The, the school, I mean, was near London. I first went there in September, soon after the year 1870, and among the boys who arrived on the same day was one whom I took to, a Highland boy, whom I will call MacLeod. I needn't spend time in describing him. The main thing is that I came to know him well. He was not an exceptional boy in any way, not particularly good at games or books, but he suited me. At one term, perhaps it was my third or fourth, a new master made his appearance. His name was Samson. He was a tallish, stoutish, pale, black-bearded man. I think we liked him. He had travelled a good deal, and had stories which amused us on our school walks, so that there was some competition among us to get within earshot of him. I remember, too, that he had a charm on his watch-chain that attracted my attention one day, and he let me examine it. It was, I now know, a gold Byzantine coin. There was the image of some absurd emperor on one side of it. The other side had worn practically smooth, and he had cut on it, rather barbarously, his own initials, G.W.S., and a date, 24th of July, 1865. Yes, I can see it now. He told me he'd picked it up in Constantinople. It was about the size of a florin, perhaps rather smaller. Well, the first odd thing that happened was like this. Samson was doing Latin grammar with us. One of his favourite methods, perhaps it's rather a good one, was to make us construct sentences out of our own heads to illustrate the rules he was trying to make us learn. Of course, that's a thing which gives silly boys the chance of being impertinent, but Samson was too good a disciplinarian for us to think of trying that on him. Now, on this occasion, he was telling us how to express remembering in Latin, and he ordered us each to make a sentence bringing in the verb memini, I remember. Well, most of us made up some ordinary, rather uninteresting sentence, except the boy I mentioned, MacLeod, who was obviously thinking of something more elaborate than I remember my father or whatever. The rest of us wanted to have our sentences passed and get on to something else, so I poked him and whispered to him to look sharp, but he didn't seem to attend. I looked at his paper and saw that he'd put down nothing at all. 
So I jogged him again harder than before, and upbraided him sharply for keeping us waiting. That did have some effect. He started and seemed to wake up, and then, very quickly, he scribbled down about a couple of lines on his paper and showed it up with the rest. As it was the last to come in, and as Samson had a lot to say to the boys who had written Meminiscimus Patri Meo, it turned out that the clock struck twelve before he had got to MacLeod, and MacLeod had to wait behind to have his sentence corrected. There was nothing much going on outside when I got out, so I waited for him to come. He walked out very slowly, and I guessed there had been some sort of trouble. Well, I said, what did you get? Oh, I don't know, said MacLeod. Nothing much. But I think Samson's rather annoyed with me. Why, did you show him up some rot? Oh, no fear, he said. It was all right as far as I could see. Uh, it was like this. Memento pute inter quater taxus. What silly rot, I said. What made you shove that down? What does it mean? That's the funny part, said MacLeod. All I know is it just came into my head and I cocked it down. I mean, I know what I think it means, because just before I wrote it down, I had a sort of picture of it in my head. I believe it means, remember the well among the four, uh, what are those dark sort of trees that have red berries on them? Mountain ashes, I suppose you mean, I replied. No, I never heard of them, said MacLeod. No, I I'll tell you, they're, they're yews. Well, and what does Samson say? Why, he was jolly odd about it. I mean, when he read it, he got up and he went to the mantelpiece and he stopped quite a long time without saying anything with his back to me. And then he said, without turning round and rather quietly, What do you suppose that means? I told him what I thought, only I couldn't remember the name of those silly trees. And then he wanted to know why I had put it down. And I had to say something or other. And after that, he left off talking about it but he wasn't looking a bit well. Next day, MacLeod took to his bed with a chill or something of the kind, and it was a week or so before he was in school again. Whether or not Mr. Samson was really startled, as MacLeod had thought, he didn't show it. I'm pretty sure, of course, now, that there was something very curious in his past history. There was one other incident of the same kind. Several times since that day... We had to make up examples in school to illustrate different rules, but there'd never been any row except when we did them wrong. At last there came a day when we were going through those dismal things which people call conditional sentences, and we were told to make a conditional sentence expressing a future consequence. We did it, right or wrong, and showed our bits of paper, and Samson began looking at them. All at once he got up, made some sort of odd noise in his throat, and rushed out of the door. We sat there for a minute or two, and then, I suppose it was incorrect, but we went up, I and one or two others, to look at the papers on his desk. Well, the top paper on his desk was written in red ink, which no one used, and it wasn't in anyone's handwriting who was in the class. They all looked at it, MacLeod and all, and took their dying oaths that it wasn't theirs. Then I thought of counting the bits of paper, and of this I made quite certain that there were seventeen bits of paper on the desk and sixteen boys in the form. Well, I bagged the extra paper and kept it, and I believe I have it now. And now you'll want to know what was written on it. It was simple enough and harmless enough, I should have said. Si tu non veneris ad me... Ego veniam ad te, which means, I suppose, if you don't come to me, I'll come to you. That same afternoon, I took it out of my locker. I know for certain it was the same bit, for I made a finger mark upon it, and no single trace of writing of any kind was there on it. I kept it as I said, and since that time I've tried various experiments to see whether invisible ink had been used, but absolutely without result. So much for that. After about half an hour, Samson looked in again, said he'd felt very unwell, and told us we might go. Next day he was in school again, much as usual. And that night the third and last incident in my story happened.
We, MacLeod and I, slept in a dormitory at night, at right angles to the main building on the first floor. There was a very bright full moon. At an hour which I can't tell exactly, but some time between one and two, I was woken by somebody shaking me. It was MacLeod, and a nice state of mind he seemed to be in. Come, he said, come, there's a burglar getting in through Samson's window. As soon as I could speak, I said, well, why not call out and wake everybody up? No, no, he said, I'm not sure who it is. Don't make a row. Come and look. Well, naturally, I came and looked, and naturally there was no one there. I was cross enough and should have called MacLeod plenty of names, only I couldn't tell why. It seemed to me there was something wrong, something that made me glad I wasn't alone to face it. We were still at the window looking out, and as soon as I could, I asked him what he'd heard or seen. I didn't hear anything at all, he said, but about five minutes before I woke you, I found myself looking out of this window here, and there was a man sitting or kneeling on Samson's window sill and looking in, and I thought he was beckoning. He was beastly thin, and he looked as if he was wet all over, and, he said, looking round and whispering, as if he hardly liked to hear himself, I'm not at all sure that he was alive. The next day Mr. Sampson was gone, not to be found, and I believe no trace of him has ever come to light since. In thinking it over, one of the oddest things about it all has seemed to me to be the fact that neither MacLeod nor I ever mentioned what we had seen to any third person whatever. We seemed unable to speak about it at the time. Over the years, however, I have told the tale a number of times once to a gentleman who had been staying at a country house in Ireland. One evening his host was turning over a drawer full of odds and ends in the smoking room. Suddenly he put his hands on a little box. Now, he said, you know about old things. Tell me what that is. My friend opened the little box and found in it a thin gold chain with an object attached to it. Well, what's the history of this? he asked. Odd enough, was the answer. You know the yew thicket in the shrubbery? Well, a year or two back we were clearing out the old well that used to be in the clearing here. And what do you suppose we found? Is it possible you found a, a, a body? said the visitor, with an odd feeling of nervousness. We did that. But what's more, in every sense of the word, we found two. Good heavens, two. Was there anything to show how they got there? Uh, was this thing found with them? It was. Amongst the rags and the clothes that were on one of the bodies. It is a bad business, whatever the story of it may have been. One body had the arms tight round the other. Oh, they must have been there for thirty years or more. Long enough before we came to this place. You may judge, we filled the well up fast enough. Do you make anything of what's caught on that gold coin you have there? I think I can, said my friend, holding it to the light. It seems to be GWS, 24th of July, 1865. 